Hey everyone, Michael Longer here from the HR McMillan Space Center with another edition of Ask an Astronomer. A few minutes late, thanks for being patient with us, but we have lots of exciting news for you. And as uh, always, we have our astronomer uh, to tell us all about that uh, exciting news, and that is uh, our astronomer, Marley. How's it going, Marley? It's good. Glad we got the tech issues figured out. But what, you know, what would it be without a couple tech issues? That's right. Uh, uh, happy May the 4th be with you, Marley. Yesterday, did you uh, did you celebrate the uh, the holiday? Uh, well, I did watch the new Kenobi trailer and I told my partner to not talk to me for approximately a minute and 30 <laughs> seconds while I was watching it. And so, yeah, I guess so. I did in a way. Yeah, well, I certainly uh, I'm in the middle of watching Bad Batch, so I'm very excited. Had an amazing conversation uh, for our online event with Carmelo Estridge, uh, who wrote a book called Star Wars Multiverse. Uh, so if you uh, have access, um, you know, uh, to a library or you can go order it online, it, definitely a great uh, book that gets into lots of issues around the multiverse of Star Wars, the different cultural aspects of it, of gender and, and war and colonialism and diversity. Uh, fascinating conversation and of course today is revenge of the fifth uh which is um another star wars holiday and we have an in-person event uh tonight there's still tickets left uh if you want to come and join the 501 legion are going to be uh in the building tonight uh they're going to have a lot of fun marley you've got a full show set up uh, all about galaxies if i'm not uh, mistaken yeah all about galaxies i took the theme of a galaxy far far away and kind of dive into well what do we know about galaxies and ones that are far far away or are they very like a long long time ago how does that work with <laughs> with all this stuff and uh, looking at it from astronomy so a lot about galaxies a little bit about black holes uh but a lot about galaxies well speaking of black holes we have got some uh news to talk about of course it just happened to be black hole week uh so let's start with that and like some basics around black holes and maybe we'll tease out uh what this potential news item uh might be uh, coming up later this month right so black hole week um is actually only four days so i don't know if you could call it a week <laughs> it is only from may 2nd to may 6th so it ends tomorrow so that it's a NASA kind of initiative to celebrate, you know, and talk about questions we may have about black holes. And they are very mysterious and very exciting, uh, you know, astronomical phenomenon. And so it's kind of just a little couple of days to talk about them more and some of the science that's currently going on about black holes. Awesome. Well, they're definitely one of my favorite phenomena. So uh, tell us more about them. Well, just like some basics is that a black hole, what we refer to when we're talking about a black hole is a region of space time where gravity is so strong, nothing can escape. So not even light can escape from a black hole. And so it's like no, not even particles or light or anything like that. So it's a bunch of matter or, you know, stuff squished into a very, very small er uh, area. So they were predicted by the theory of general relativity, which predicts that a sufficiently compacted mass can deform space time enough to form a black hole is really uh, what that is. And the little image that you're seeing there, visualization is uh, supercomputer data showing low energy X-rays in the red uh, for, from the inner accretion disk of a black hole and high energy X-rays in the blue from the inner corona of the black hole. And so we'll get into more of what an accretion disk is and stuff there uh, in a second. But yeah, really, really, no, one go ahead. One of the questions that I've uh, always wondered about, because I, uh, I sometimes get asked by people, because they look at an image like this and they mm -hmm. say, oh, I've seen something like that. Like when I'm in the shower and I see the water going down the drain. So is that a good analogy of what's happening here with the black hole? Yeah, it is. It's it's a, a good way to visualize what we what you if you could see it, what it would look like. You would have a bunch of matter like spinning around a point of, of gravity, but not all of it necessarily uh goes into that to that point. Some of it can uh, become accelerated and shoot outwards along the poles, and like these really cool jets that we see in large galaxies. And different black holes will have kind of different, more extreme features depending on the size of them. Uh, as well. Uh, jets are, we see those large jets in the ones in the center of galaxies, not necessarily ones that are just, you know, uh, doing their thing kind of, kind of in the, in the universe, but all, all right, of well, them will have an event horizon and a singularity. That was like the two main parts of the black hole. <laughs> okay. Well, let's get into a little bit more how they work. So how they work is, well, things kind of have to cross the event horizon to be able to be pulled into the singularity. So it's a bit kind of, hard in a way to explain because there's it's none of it's a physical surface we can touch. So the singularity is the 
in part in the center where all the mass is. So all of the mass is condensed into this one tiny spot, tiny, tiny spot. Uh, the Havren horizon is like our point of no return. So it's not a physical surface, you can't touch it. It's a sphere or a circle around the singularity. It's kind of the boundary where if you wanted to escape or leave, you would have to move uh, at the speed of light. Uh, and so once you uh, cross the event horizon, you can't you can't escape anymore. The gravity is too strong for you to uh, move, uh, get out from there. There are three types of black holes and they all work and have the same things, but they're kind of found in different places. Okay, well, we've got our first question about uh, black holes, Marley, and it comes from Keith, who's uh, maybe trying to stump you because he says a different astronomer was once stumped by this question. Great. What density, <laughs> what <laughs> density does a star have to reach to collapse into a black hole? So we don't really uh, do things based on density. We do them based on the mass of the sun. And so to be sufficiently massive enough to uh, fall into collapse into a, a black hole at the end of the life, the ballpark is about eight to 10 times the mass of the sun is how much mass you would have to have. Uh, and that will be a sufficient enough mass for you to uh, when the star goes through stellar death or supernova, as it collapses down, that'll be enough mass to kind of funnel the core collapse to push it into um, a black hole singularity. So eight to 10 times the mass of the sun is kind of the, the ballpark range that we agree on so far. And uh, are these hearts, are those official um, um, <laughs> shapes of stars around the supermassive black holes? No, that's me because I love supermassive black holes because I love galaxies. So they're my favorite ones. Uh, stellar mass holes are also cool, you know, stellar mass black holes. Those are the ones that people uh, kind of think of when we think of black holes, right? Oh, a star dies and there's a black hole left over. Uh, but it's the supermassive ones that I, I, they have a very special place in my heart because I love galaxies. So, okay. So th this is relating to, we're going to get to the news in a minute, but we are, you know, kind of alluding to that uh, there's this telescope that has been looking for our black hole. When I say our black hole, uh, we live inside of a galaxy called the Milky Way. Uh, and there should be a black hole. We, well, we believe there is a black hole. Uh, we've never, you know, seen it directly, but they're trying to take a picture of this black hole in uh, our Milky Way. So where are they with that, um, that project? That is the Event Horizon Telescope Project, uh, or the uh, Event, Hor uh, Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, and they are uh, doing pretty well. They actually uh, did put out an announcement recently uh, that we'll get to in just a second, but they are and have been uh, looking for kind of a picture of our black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. We call this Sagittarius A star. Uh, the star is like the little asterisk, but that's how you would say it. And we don't see it directly, like you said, but we do uh, have been looking at the orbits of the stars around it, which is what this animation is showing. This is an animation of the stellar orbits around the galactic center uh, from the UCLA Galactic Center Group. And they tracked a bunch of stars around the proposed black hole. Uh, it's not confirmed, but it's it's there. Um, and they've actually been looking at these stellar orbits for 25 years in the infrared specifically, because it's able to see through all that dust and gas um, using the Keck telescope in Hawaii. And so by tracking the orbit of these stars and how interesting they are, it's particularly the one in the yellow uh, with the yellow orbit, because that one they've actually been able to see do a complete orbit. Uh, it, its orbit is about 16 years. And so by mm. looking at it for 25, we've seen it go completely around and complete a singular orbit. And so using that and estimating, you know, the mass of the star and using Kepler's laws, they've determined that the mass of whatever that those stars are orbiting has to be 4 million times the mass of the sun. And so that would be, there's nothing big enough unless it's a supermassive black hole. So that is kind of where we get the starting of, oh, what can we be looking at? Is it a black hole? And in comes in the Event Horizon Telescope campaign. So they actually just completed their 2022 campaign uh, which was about seven days of observations for, uh, between March 15th and March 28th. It consisted of 11 observatories and the Event Horizon 2022 campaign, their primary targets were uh, the black hole in, the, in M87, which is what this image is of. That was the image of the black hole was of that black hole and Sagittarius A star was the other primary target. So they wanted to look at both of them and they just uh, put out an announcement actually that they will be holding a press conference to announce a groundbreaking discovery in the Milky Way. <laughs> so pretty much they've probably gotten a picture of it. 
uh, though they won't say it. It'll be on May 12th at 6 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Uh, and so everyone's, well, everyone, the astronomers I, I listen to and, and follow are kind of being like, oh, this, this might be the image because what else would they be looking at? So that's kind of where we're at with this. Uh, the link there is where they will be live streaming uh, the event from. So it has been a target of the collaboration since 2017. The originally why it wasn't a the target when they uh, looked at M87 instead was because there was a lot of pollution uh, in front of the viewing. So, you know, as we look into the center of our galaxy, we have to look through stars and dust and gas and stuff. And so it was just too, too much happening for them to be able to look at it. And so M87 was the better option. Uh, but now they're like, hey, we may have something. And it's unclear if the uh, data was from this more recent 2022 run or if it was from when they looked, because they didn't look at it, just not for as long as they dedicated the M87 uh viewing so or if it's from previous um lookings or previous campaigns but there is something to do with the milky way so it's probably <laughs> probably our black hole i love the the foreshadowing you know the teasing out of this like we are a uh, telescope project that takes pictures of black holes we are working uh towards a picture of something inside of our milky way what could it possibly be, be? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's like, okay, it could be something. I don't know what else it could be, though. Like, it, I'm like, you kind of wedged yourself into a hole here, guys. Like, you don't, you don't do much else. So this is kind of your thing. So it's probably <laughs> yeah. an image, but. I mean, uh, I think for our job, I think I appreciate, you know, having sort of like the heads up so that we know to be prepared because when this announcement happens, we will likely get calls from the media. So it does help us prepare as opposed to when something just like happens and then all of a sudden our phone runs off the hook and we have to drop everything. All the, you know, it's like we don't have anything to do. We have lots to do, but this <laughs> helps us prepare uh, for what's coming up. Very exciting. Uh, looking forward uh, to this picture. So uh, we do got some questions uh, all about black holes, you know, uh, Keith mm -hmm. and Pride, uh, of course, uh, very active in the chats. Thanks for uh, joining again, folks. So just following up on Keith, um, he says the other astronomer said the density doesn't apply because a black hole has no volume. The singularity is considered zero volume uh, and thus couldn't give uh, give an answer. Yeah, I mean, if I, I think I understood your question as how big does the star have to be to form a black hole, which when mm -hmm. we talk about that, we talk about it in terms of, of mass uh, density, you know, it just needs to have enough mass to collapse down a singularity I've heard described as a place of infinite density, which you could very well just call it zero density. Um, it really is a zero kind of like a either or situation, but both could be right. I could, I could see the both ways because it's just a place where all the mass goes and it's a, it's a, it's infinite mass in an infinitely small area, which would become watch this. That's not a mathematical thing. So it becomes a, a zero density type thing, right? Cause density mass over volume. If you have infinity, infinity over infinity, you have um, something my calculus teacher would get very mad at me about. So mm -hmm. there, there's that. <laughs> yeah, you can't have infinity over infinity. <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't work that way. So. Uh, so the other thing that uh, Pride would want to know about, because you'd sort of teased out about micro black holes. So tell us a little bit more about uh, what a micro black hole might be. A micro black hole or a stellar black hole? Well, I guess sort of or... like the like the really tiny tiny ones that 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 sort of fluctuate around a galaxy. Okay, I'm a bit confused about what what that might be. I'm going back to my my types. So. What I know about the types of black holes is there's like three types that we we know about. So stellar, intermediate, and supermassive. And intermediate is the one that's like a hotly debated type. We're like kind of kind of figuring that out. Right. So stellar are the ones that what we usually talk about when uh, black holes. We talk about black holes. So you know the star dies. It's a stellar mass black hole. So they're usually between three and ten solar masses. Uh, how big those ones are. Uh, the supermassive ones are really, really big, millions to the billions of the solar masses, like our Milky Way uh, black hole is like 4 million times the mass of the sun. The M87 black hole is like some billions times the mass of our sun, so they're quite, quite mm -hmm. large. Intermediate ones, ugh, estimated about 100 to 1,000 solar masses. Uh, no star could get that big that we know of uh, to collapse down into something that massive, and so scientists think that it comes from a black hole either accreting and absorbing a lot of material or two black holes merging together. But we don't have answers to those questions 
from those scenarios at this time like we're still looking for them yeah i think i think they're referring to you know in our solar system where planet x you know was sort of theorized to be perhaps you know one of these smaller types i, I don't know if micro black hole is, is the right uh, the right term for that and then of course there was people talking about maybe the large hadron collider might be able to uh create oh. some of these you know very small black holes um so i don't know if micro black hole is, is the right term for that micro black holes oh okay so oh is this like a quantum mechanics thing because i do not know a lot yeah about a quantum mechanics thing so something that are like less than the mass of the sun type would be would be the black hole so very yeah. very small uh micro black holes um they're hypothetical again like we haven't we haven't seen them um but that would stop being a we'd stop looking at them kind of through the lens of uh, astrophysics and start looking at them more more through the lens of quantum mechanics because right. that's where quantum mechanics will start to play a really really important role uh, that was not something I really you know was interested in or studied a lot when I was when I was in university quantum mechanics and stuff like that because I find it very hard to understand something so so small um, I prefer things very, very big. Uh, <laughs> that's the hearts around the supermassive black hole. That's the hearts around hole. the supermassive black hole. I'm like, I get it. You're big. Lots is happening. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's more a very kind of confusing topic for me uh, personally. But they'd be, yeah, more, yeah, better luck asking someone that knows more about quantum mechanics and and that that sort of role. All right, let's uh, let's let's put a pin in that, and maybe maybe we'll, we'll find an answer for the for next ask an astronomer. For next ask an astronomer, yeah. Talk to me next week. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what I can figure out. Well, then tell us a little bit more because they're about these uh, these black hole hunters. Because there's some other projects that are hunting for these, right? Yeah. So this is this is something you know I found in the meantime. If you want, didn't want to wait for this announcement uh, till the twelfth. In the meantime, you can actually help uh, in a citizen science project looking for uh, black holes because. This, uh, the majority of stars we know actually live with a companion in a binary. So there's two stars and they orbit the center of mass together. Our sun doesn't have one. It's been hypothesized, maybe we did, but as of now, we, we don't have a companion star. Uh, what happens with these binary stars is that it is possible that one of these stars uh, will die in a supernova and be massive enough to create a compact object at the end, or a compact object is what is either a black hole or a neutron star. Uh, these, if, if the supernova happens and it doesn't tear the system apart, it, you'll be left with a compact object like a black hole and a quote unquote normal star orbiting the center of mass. So sometimes the compact object can accrete material from that star. Uh, and that has allowed us to find about 30 binary systems containing black holes and 100 ish containing neutron stars because that accretion uh, creates a lot of light, usually in the x ray, uh, that we are able to see with telescopes. Uh, but computer-based simulations say that there should be hundreds of thousands of these types of systems that are not actively accreting, and finding those is something that astronomers are trying to do. And what they do is through a method called uh, self-lensing, using this uh, phenomenon to help us find them. Because when an object passes in front of something, light is bent around it. We see that you know, mm -hmm. Einstein rings and stuff like that. In this case, uh, the compact object will pass in front of the star, the light is bent and is actually magnified, and so the signal gets brighter, the star gets brighter than it otherwise normally would. Uh, we've done this before with white dwarves, and so we know that this method works, and if we can see this brightness based on the uh, brightness to how much it is magnified, we can estimate uh, if we know the mass and the radius of the star that is being passed in front of, we can estimate the mass of the compact object. And after a certain mass, it starts to become a black hole. So this is a citizen science project. I think they are like 97% complete. So they still just have, they have a couple more things to look at that you can go and look at and look at signals and see, if, you know, help them try to determine if it's a black hole or not. Though the signal that you're looking for is quite rare. Um, there's nothing better than kind of like humans are really good at seeing patterns. Our brain likes it. So computers have a world. They're only as good as we can make them, the computers. And so sometimes it is better to just have a whole bunch of people look at the same stuff mm -hmm. um, and you can help. It's fun. Yeah, this is very cool. Zooniverse is a is a great um, place to go for amateur astronomers. And amateur astronomy, you know, is is a word that really just means that you're not working, you know, and getting paid, but you can certainly contribute um, a lot. And a lot of you know very smart people. Um, and also, if you're in, in, if you're just starting out um, 
uh, in this field, you can go there and just uh, play around. It's a great uh, resource to use for everyone. Uh, let's uh, jump to a few last news items for our last uh, few minutes here for this uh, episode of Ask an Astronomer Marley. So we've got we've got an update on on Webb as well as a lunar eclipse coming up. Oh yeah, so this is this one's for my grandfather. Uh, Web is fully aligned, so there we go. All instruments fully aligned. These are images from each of the uh, instruments on Web with the red filter added for us to be able to see better contrast. Uh, this was announced on April twenty eighth. The optical performance is better than the most optimistic uh, predictions the engineering team had. Uh, do note that the engineering team tends to like. They love to hedge their bets, you know, like they're like, if it's really bad, then it's, well, you know, we can get by, but it's doing really, really well. Uh, the image quality is diffraction limited, which means that the detail we can see is as good as is physically possible, given the size of web and the laws of physics. That's also why you're seeing uh, the spikes in the stars that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. The only changes from now on will be very small changes to the primary mirror segments as necessary. And they have now moved on to the final uh, step of preparation, uh, science instrument commissioning. This will take two months. This is getting all of the instruments ready to actually conduct science. And what's fun about these images is they're all part of the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a satellite galaxy just outside the Milky Way. Uh, and so Webb just looked at it and lots of stars. And the way the images are sized and positioned represents uh, the relative arrangement of each of Webb's instruments. And so they don't all look at the same part of the night sky. It's just slightly offset from each other. So mm -hmm. these are all of them. Uh, not all of them will be used to take images. Of course, the imaging instruments are just NearCam, Nearis, and MIRI. And NearSpec is a spectrograph, uh, which could, but it can take images. And FGS is the fine guidance sensor. So that's just what uh, Web uses to keep itself pointed the right way it needs to be. So it's not used for scientific imaging, but it takes a lot of calibration images is what it will do. Awesome. There's so much to kind of like unpack with with these images. Of course, these are just uh, test images. Uh, we're going to get more fine detailed images probably uh, next month or two. Probably July is what okay. is what my heart says. Probably beginning end of June, beginning July, somewhere somewhere in there. I think we'll get the, some of their big uh, big images. Next okay. for Web is thermal stability, which is okay. just making sure it works well heat wise. Uh, moving it so that it's heating up, moving it so it's cooling down, making sure that any errors they find uh, and errors that happen with the data, they can then apply to future observations so we don't, um, you know, get an observation that we don't fully understand. And this is just more steps. And then the lunar eclipse is happening May 15th, will be a total lunar eclipse. So the moon will be fully covered by the Earth's shadow or umbra. Uh, it'll go that red color that happens with the total lunar eclipse. Uh, to view it, you'll want a clear view of the southeast horizon and the sky, because for us, the moon will actually already have started the eclipse when it rises uh, over. Mm. So it'll rise red, which I think will be very cool. Mm -hmm. This, unfortunately, will make it very hard to see. It'll be very, very dim. And because it's on the horizon, it'll be even more difficult. So it'll be uh, much easier to see. It'll get easier and easier to see as it moves out of the shadow and as it gets higher in the sky. So you will get to see it hopefully yeah and that's always that you know the challenge i think especially here uh in the lower mainland uh if if you live here so think about where you are and think about sort of like where the horizon is to the southeast uh, we'll be having an event uh here at the space center uh, we will be getting on some telescopes of course we're gonna have to move away actually from where our dome is because right where our dome is there's a bunch of trees uh in the way and of course where you live you may have some buildings you know there's a lot of of th things that we have in our horizon line um so you kind of want to find a spot but i think that'll be pretty cool you know even if we just see like a little corner of the of the of the moon eclipsed kind of like coming up over buildings that could look really neat i'm 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 thinking so uh, we'll be here on site uh, Marley you've got put together a little uh, presentation in the planetarium you can come by uh, for an event and of course we're going to go um, see if we can go a little bit further towards um, oh, the Vancouver archives building and uh, Barton in the beach if you um, if you were familiar with the uh, the venue park area we'll get the telescope there and see if we can see if we can spot the moon uh, coming uh, into eclipse and of course our fingers crossed for no clouds because uh, clouds can't see anything uh, 
Um, but Marley, this has been another uh, fantastic episode. We got through our technical difficulties. Thank you all so much for joining us for another edition. Like I said at the beginning of the show tonight, uh, May the 5th, uh, May the 6th, uh, is uh, happening so we've got in-person event happening marley is going to be in the planetarium flying you around galaxies through the lens of star wars and we had the 501 legion that is all of the empire uh maybe have a boba fett maybe uh Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be, I don't want to give away uh, who's going to be here, but we have at least 11 characters that are going to be in the building. So uh, prime opportunity to take a picture um, with these uh, with these amazing volunteers that come out uh, and give us their time uh, to hang out with you. Uh, so lots of fun stuff happening. Go to our website, spacecenter.ca. We will be back here on YouTube in two weeks. Until then, clear skies. <laughs>